Good afternoon, everyone. Can everyone hear me? If you can just please give an indication in the chat or by raising your hand or by unmuting your mic and just saying something. Awesome, thank you. So let's give it another minute or two to see if more people will join us. Currently, I see there's 79 people registered in the class list. So let's give another minute or two. I apologize for the convenience of having classes online, but I am unable to get access to campus. Uh, protesters uh, are blocking all roads and security for safety measures has locked down entrances. So today's and tomorrow's classes will be online for everybody's safety, if that is okay with everyone. Okay, cool. So are all of you find that protest action stop you from getting to campus? Because I was on camp, trying to get on campus from nine o'clock this morning and I'm struggling to get on campus. So I'm going to record this lecture and upload it to YouTube and provide a link afterwards. So today is only going to be a introduction lecture. So I think it's now two minutes has passed. So I think we can now start with our introduction lecture. Can everybody see the screen of the lecture slides that I'm sharing? Can I have an indication if you can see my screen, the slides? Thank you. So let's start with our intro lecture. So I am Mr. Heistek Grobler. I am a lecturer here at the Department of Physics. I'm also a PhD student at UP as well, and I'm also lecturing at the Northwest University. So for this introduction, I'm going to go through a bit of course information, what a course is about, about me as a lecturer, and some cool astronomy stuff. So first of all, I'm Mr. Eister Krober. You can find me in the Department of Physics. So I have two offices on campus. So the first office is in the Physics Department. That's on floor five, office 68. And the majority of the time, I'm in the CFM building. So the Carl and Emily Fuchs Institute for Microelectronics, room 221. You can meet me there as well. Um, I have no official consultation time, so please send me an email and we can set up a consultation session. Otherwise, if I'm on campus, you can meet me anytime on campus. Uh, if I'm on campus, I have an open door policy. Uh, so if you're on campus, you can just walk by. Otherwise, you can send an email. I'm also setting up a Discord server for communication purposes as well. So all formal communication for this module will happen through ClickUp. And all class notes and everything will be on ClickUp. I'm going to use Discord as well as a communication platform. And then my preferred method for communication is email. And the only reason I state email is if something needs to be escalated or if I need to hand it over to the head of the department, the head of the department will ask me in any case to send an email for paper trails. So if there's a problem or if you need help with anything, please send me an email, then everything is already in the correct format. The textbook we are using, Horizons, Exploring the Universe, the 14th edition. 
The textbook should be in store at the bookshop on campus and also other bookshops such as Van Skyk and um, Protea, they should have in stock. This is how the textbook looks like. Then there's also a second textbook that is not compulsory. This is just additional material. So the compulsory textbook you should have. The additional textbook is just for your own knowledge and for extra information. You can download it. It's an open source textbook. So you can download it from the OpenStax website by making use of this link. And this is how that textbook look like. But remember, this is only an additional textbook. So how will be the course be evaluated? So the course will have a semester test that will happen on the 23rd, 23rd of April from five to seven. And then it's gonna be one big assignment. The assignment has the same weighting as a semester test. Don't underestimate the assignment that will start on the 20th of May. I will talk about the assignment in tomorrow's class and I will publish the exam dates as soon as I obtain it myself. The semester mark will consist 50% out of the semester test, 40% out of assignments, and 10% out of quizzes. So every second week, I'm going to have a small quiz online via ClickUp that you guys will have. And then for your final mark, the semester mark will count 50%, and exam mark will count the other 50%. One thing to remember is to gain access to the exam, you need a minimum of 40% for your semester mark. Does everyone understand that? So I try to have my classes as interactive as possible. So don't be shy. Type in the chat, raise your hand, unmute your mic. Let's see if we can get a class participation to a maximum. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Yes, sir. I see a raised hand. If you have a raised hand, then you're more than welcome to unmute yourself and ask a question, or you will call more than welcome to interrupt me anytime. And then finally, to pass the module, you need a minimum of 50% for your final mark. So that means if you have a 60% semester mark, you will get 40% for the exam, and that will give you an average of 50% and you will pass. But remember, to pass the exam as well, you also need a sub minimum of 40% for the exam. So what that means is if you get a 70% semester mark, you will still need a 40% in the exam to pass. Does everyone understand that? Awesome. And then one thing I'm going to say again, do not underestimate the assignment. I'm going to go through the assignment. You have the entire semester to do the assignment. In tomorrow's lecture, you can already read up about the assignment on ClickUp. I've posted the assignment guide. Do not underestimate the assignment. So let's start. What is this course all about? So the aim of this course is to get a non-technical introduction to astronomy, meaning you do not need to have a prior math or physics background, and you also do not need to have a prior technical background. Everything you're going to need to learn is going to happen inside this course, and hopefully it will open your eye up to the world of astronomy and astrophysics. So who am I? So not too long ago, I was sitting in the same benches as you guys, also first year of university. And I always wondered what makes that lecturer qualified to teach that course. So like I said, I'm Heistek Grobler. I did a first a BSc in computer science. After that, I did a B in, in electrical and electronic engineering. After that, I did a master's in astronomy, and I'm now busy with my PhD in astronomy. So you guys are actually very lucky. When I was undergraduate, you weren't able to take astronomy courses or astronomy degree um, 
from undergraduate level and only from master's level. And to get to that level, you need the appropriate background. So a BSc in physics, computer science, mathematics, applied mathematics, and electrical and electronic engineering gets you the proper background to do astronomy. So you guys are extremely lucky because you can take now astronomy course from first year already. So this image was taken at the Green Bank Observatory in West Virginia. I've spent a lot of time at this observatory. It's a radio astronomy observatory and it's the world's third largest telescope. So astronomy is cool. So what can you guys tell me about astronomy or what do you guys know about astronomy? Yes, so space. So let me show you a few interesting things I've been involved with during the years. So in one of my undergraduate courses, I built and raced a concrete canoe against other universities. So the only thing required for this competition is you build a canoe out of concrete. So one thing is you determine the density of water, then your concrete needs to be less dense than water, then it floats on water. So we, so I did my undergraduate degree at the University of Johannesburg and we raced against WITS, UP, TUT and NWU. So that was a really cool project. I've also built and designed a rocket and satellite. We participated on the CANSAT challenge, meaning the satellite you build is physically the size of a Coke can. Then you launch it as high up in the atmosphere as possible, do an experiment in the atmosphere, and then you need to recover your rocket and satellite again. So we reached an altitude of 1.4 kilometers in the air, and our satellite measured the atmospheric pressure, temperature, wind speed, uh, humidity, uh, how much G-forces you are pulling with gyroscopes. That was a very, very cool and exciting project. So here we can see the first stage separation and the first stage falling back to the ground and its parachutes deploying. I've also spent a lot of time at the SALT Observatory, so SALT and Sutherland. SALT is the South African Large Telescope. Are you guys familiar with SALT? Yes, so SALT was created in the early 2000s, and it is the, um, what I call it, the biggest optical telescope in the Southern Hemisphere. Then this is the observatory I spent most of my time at. This is the Hartebius Radio Astronomy Observatory. That has now been renamed as part of the South African Radio Astronomy Observatory, Hartebius Hook site, but it's still known as HARTRAL or the Hartebius Hook Radio Astronomy Observatory. So this facility was built in the early 1960s, and three of these facilities was built 120 degrees apart across the globe. And this was built to do primarily to do tracking and telemetry on the Apollo space program. So once the space program was done in 74 and the Apollo program finished, NASA had no, no use for the site. And then the South African government, back then was the CSIR, so the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, to control over the site. And has been operating the site as a radio telescope ever since. In the early 2000s, the NRF, National Research Foundation, to control over the site. So this is located halfway between Krugersdorp and Hartwigespoort Dam. So if you guys have ever traveled on a road with those satellite dishes next to the road, this is in the valley down below. And I will come in a short moment, I will distinguish the difference between what is optical astronomy and what is radio astronomy. So this, uh, the observatory, this is also one of the giant lasers we have called a satellite laser ranger or SLR. Does any one of you have an idea of what we use this site for?
or this laser fall rather. So to give you an idea, a normal red laser pointer that you, everyone has played with has a power output of about 1.3 milliwatts, a green laser pointer about 200 milliwatts. This is a 1.3 gigawatt pulsed laser. And we use it to do tracking on satellites. That's the only way you can do proper tracking on satellites. So satellites are fitted with what we call it tube reflectors or corner reflectors. That's a little prisms that reflect any incident light to the origin. So we literally shoot a satellite with this laser. We record how long it takes for the laser beam to reflect back. And from there on, we can calculate the exact orbit of a satellite to three millimeters. So this is the most accurate and waste way to track satellites. So when new satellites get launched, we have priority tracking missions. And the reason we do it is, if you don't track satellites day by day, its orbit changes. So we let a government organization or whoever knows to please push its satellites back in orbit where it needs to be, because otherwise it can drift into deep space and you can lose it. It can shift into a low orbit and burn out in its atmosphere, or it can literally hit another satellite and we don't want that. This is the Green Bank Observatory, and this is the Green Bank Telescope, the world's largest uh, steerable structure and third largest telescope. It is 45 stories high, and the collecting area, so let me see if I can get a pointer. So this collecting area is 110 meters in diameter. So that means you have a telescope that is 45 stories high, and is larger than a rugby field that you can move up and down and full 360 degrees. This was also the coldest day I've experienced in my life. That was minus 27 degrees Celsius outside. So the observatory stopped operations at minus 22 degrees because then the oil in the gearboxes actually solidifies and becomes a jelly. So this was also one great experience. So I've spent a lot of time at this observatory. So here you can see the telescope from the side. Is everybody still following? Can everyone still hear me? Okay, please interrupt me if you have any questions. Can you guys guess what this is? Any ideas what this is? So let me move on to the next slide. That is a microwave inside a three centimeter steel box. Can you guys guess why? That is, have you guys heard about RFI, radio frequency interference? So, an optical telescope looks at visible light. A radio telescope looks at the rest of the electromagnetic spectrum. A microwave forms a part of the spectrum. So, at a radio astronomy observatory, microwaves are not allowed because you pick up the microwaves through your telescope. So, that is why the microwave inside a three centimeter steel box that acts like a Faraday cage to shield the telescope from uh, radio frequency interference. So also at the Green Bank Observatory, you're only allowed to drive these vehicles, not petrol vehicles, because the telescope is so sensitive, it actually picks up the spark plug of a petrol vehicle. And that also causes interference on the telescope. So everywhere on site, you get these RFI reminders. So at the radio telescope, so as Hadrow, um, also Green Bank and a few others, it's an RFI free zone. So here in South Africa, at Hartrau, it's a 10 kilometer radius. We have no cell phone signals, no telephone signals, no Bluetooth, no Wi-Fi, because everything causes interference on a telescope. In Meerkat in Carnarvon, that's about a 200 kilometer radius, where there's no Wi-Fi, no Bluetooth, no television, no radio. In the US, where Green Bank is located, it's a 120 mile radius, that's a radio exclusion zone. And there you get fined 
$3,000 if you are caught with your Wi-Fi or Bluetooth on. And if it's your third strike, you actually get arrested. And that is what we need to do to protect our instrumentation from radio frequency interference. So if you are working one of those sites or live near one of those sites, how do we communicate? The only thing is through optical fiber cables and ethernet cables. So if you want to get on the internet, you need to plug your computer uh, ethernet cable into your computer. If you want to connect your phone to the internet, you need to get yourself a USB-C adapter for your phone and then plug a ethernet cable into your phone, into the adapter for internet connection. So this is at Green Bank as well. So the image on the left is a storage cluster. So each one of these small little blocks contains a 18 terabyte helium drive. And to give you guys the idea with what kind of data throughput we are working with, at Outra, we are doing about 12 terabytes of data in six hours. And in um, Meerkat currently, there's 260 petabytes of data in six months. And that is where the big data problem comes into astronomy and why we need computer scientists and information scientists. Of course, how do we store this data? How do we move it around? How do we analyze it? We need to find new storage mediums. We need to find better algorithms to look for artifacts in the data. And then an image on the right is of eight FPGAs. So an FPGA is a field programmable gate array. It's a third type of processor. So a GPU and CPU that you guys are all familiar with are already specialized to do this task. So you need to reprogram them to do different things, but the FPGA is very good at parallel processing and not specialized, meaning you specialize it into whatever you want. And then we use that to analyze the data coming from the telescope to do number crunching. And in this case, it is a spectrometer that creates the spectra of an object. And then lastly, another place I've spent a lot of time is at the University of California, Berkeley, at the CASPER Research Group. So CASPER is the Collaboration for Astronomy, Signal Processing and Electronics Research. If you guys have free time, please Google the CASPER Group. The CASPER Group does really amazing things. So what do I do for my research? So this is a Roach 1 and a Roach 2 FPGA and also Scarab FPGA. I recently now moved over to the RF SOC FPGA. And I'm using this in with a hybrid architecture. So that means within also a um, off-the-shelf RTX 4090 GPU, where I use the FPGA and the GPU to create a new hybrid architecture to analyze information coming from a radio telescope. So for my application is firstly to create a spectra of the objects. So I'm sure in high school physics, you guys probably heard of emission and absorption spectrum. So we know every element and molecule in the universe radiates energy at a certain frequency and absorbs radiation at certain frequencies. So when it emits its emission spectra, when it absorbs an absorption spectra, and each element and molecule has its unique spectra, meaning its unique fingerprint. And therefore, we can determine the composition of certain objects. And to determine the composition, we use a spectrometer to create that spectrum. And then the other part of research, I mean, is some correlation. So with correlation, when two or more telescopes observe the same object at the same time, how do you correlate the data from each telescope? So I'm using an FPGA and GPU to create a new hybrid architecture where you can do correlation and also correlation with data coming from telescopes. So here we can see a spectra of a methanol maser. So do you guys know laser stands for acronym, right? Amplification by stimulation of emitted radiation. Maser is exactly the same thing. And only instead of light, it's now microwave. So here in this image, we can see the spectrum peak of methanol at 6.6 .6 gigahertz. So if we zoom it in, this peak we see right here resembles the spectrum of methanol. And that's why we know it's methanol. So now when we put this in perspective and we look at formal definitions, is astronomy is the study of the universe, the celestial objects that make up the universe 
and the processes that govern the life cycle of those objects. So an image here is again of Sol, the South African Large Telescope. But radio astronomy is a subfield of the field of astronomy that is based to find methods, techniques to measure, capture, and analyze the radio frequency electromagnetic radiation with the means of radio telescopes. So this is probably one of the most famous radio telescopes if you're a big sci-fi fan and watched movies such as First Contact, Deep Impact, and this is the VLA, the very large array in New Mexico in the USA. And you guys are all probably familiar with the electromagnetic spectrum. Somewhere in your schooling career, you probably learned about the electromagnetic spectrum. So the electromagnetic spectrum, the frequency and wavelength is inversely proportional. So that means the higher the frequency, the smaller the wavelength. And the lower the frequency, the higher the wavelength. So here we can see the visible part of the spectrum. So visible light is only a small part of the spectrum. And some optical telescopes can look at infrared and um, so optical and bit of infrared, where radio telescopes, depending on where they're designed to look at, is usually from long radio waves all the way up to UV. So as some radio telescope, because then you need great surface area, can do X-rays and gamma rays as well. Are you guys happy with the distinction between optical and radio telescopes? Awesome. So, right now, you, this is the CAT-7 telescope, you heard one. So, CAT is an acronym. It stands for the Crew Array Telescope. So, now, in modern times, we are today. We have two philosophies when it comes to telescope building. The one is you can build one giant telescope. But the problem is, the bigger you are building, the heavier your structure becomes, and it becomes harder to operate and steer. And also, the bigger you build, the exponentially more expensive it becomes. So the design philosophy now is you build rather smaller telescopes, you add a surface area together, and then you get one big telescope. So before South Africa, of the house to bid, the house to the bid to house the SKA telescope. South Africa needed to show the know-how to build, operate, and do research with radio telescopes. So the first Karoo Ray telescope was built at Artrell. And then seven more of those were built in Carnarvon and Northern Cape that became the CAT-7 array. So you have seven of these telescopes and you add a surface area together. So that is the CAT-7 telescope. In those seven telescopes became meerkat. So Afrikaans, meer van kat, more of cats. Not an animal meerkat, but literally more of the Karoo array telescope, meerkat. And as you can see, the design philosophy changed a little bit. So from here, we call this a prime focus. We have these struts with our measuring equipment on top, but we realized the struts blocks the surface area of the telescope. Then it was transformed into a Gregorian offset. We have one arm at the side, so you have your incident rays coming in, it hits the parabolic surface, gets reflected up to the subreflector on the side that hasn't blocked the surface area down to our measuring equipment. So 64 of these has been built in Carnarvon. That's the Mieke telescope. And these 64 will become 4,500 by the year 2030 to become the SKA, the square kilometer array. Meaning it will have a collecting area of one square kilometers, making it the world's largest and most sensitive scientific instrument ever built. So this is why it is a great time to get into astronomy and be part of the astronomy community because there's a lot of opportunity now. So right now we can see different images from the telescope. So right here in top left is in 2012, and this is the image of the center of our own galaxy. So here we can see the supermassive black hole at the center of our own galaxy. Here's Meerkat in 2016 in top right, and then in the bottom left is Meerkat in 2016 with 16 of the dishes. And each in every red dot you see beside at the center dot is a galaxy in the background. This is our supermassive black hole and radio emissions from it. And then Meerkat 16 in 2017, you can see more detail. Here we can see the full Meerkat telescope, so we can see the Milky Way supermassive black hole. 
radio emissions and all the other dots are galaxies in the background. That is amazing. And this image is from the Event Horizon Telescope. So the Event Horizon Telescopes makes use of radio telescopes across the globe and in orbit that can observe X-rays. And by making use of correlation and a technique we call interferometry, we can create a virtual telescope that is the size of the distances between these telescopes. So if you look at all these lines, we call that base bands. Our, and we can create a virtual telescope that is the size of these base bands. So with the Event Horizon Telescope, the first thing we need to do to study the universe is you need to create a mathematical model. So the people working on the Event Horizon Telescope said, okay, we need a simulation and algorithm to go look for jam jars on the internet. And that is the result it provided. And then secondly, they asked for chocolate chip cookies, and that is the result. So that means that our different results need to be fine-tuned. And this is the result we they obtained. So it's important to figure out how the math works. So in the 1970s, this was how, how it was envisioned, how a black hole would look like. And then with the Event Horizon Telescope, they created algorithms stating that the first, first image of a black hole will look something like this. And when it was actually captured, this is how the first black hole looked like. And that is actually quite amazing because it shows the mathematical model spot on, the simulations are spot on, showing that we understand the physics around it and what governs it. Another object we can observe in the universe is a pulsar, and we will learn about pulsars in this course. So a pulsar is a small to medium star that's at the end of the life cycle collapsed in on itself and it squished the core into a tiny area. And you can think about it as an ice skater spinning around. If the ice skater's arm is squished out, she spins slowly. If she pulls her arms in, she spins faster. So you have the entire radius of a star squished into a object only a couple of kilometers in diameter meaning it spins very fast due to the conservation of angular momentum. But a part of its surface still radiates energy. And that means it's spinning around like a lighthouse that we can see flashing across Earth and we pick up those pulses and we call that a pulsar. Are you guys still happy, still following? Awesome. Another object we observe and that you will learn about in this course are quasars. So quasars are the centers of galaxies that are extremely active. So that means this, so each and every galaxy has a supermassive black hole in the center. And that means that supermassive black hole are extremely active. But we will talk about that in, um, later detail in this course. And then we have a maser. So a maser that we talked about earlier is a molecular cloud. And those molecular clouds usually occur in areas where stars are being born, usually more specific in high mass star forming regions. And we will talk about that in this module as well. And as you can see here, it's a radio image, meaning observed by a radio telescope of a solar eclipse at a Green Bank telescope. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was our introduction lecture. Do you have any questions? Yes, sir. Um, is it me? Yeah, yes. Um, so how in depth do we get in terms of um, like calculations and science with this course? Okay, so this course is not going to be math intensive and it's also not going to be physics intensive because we have people, so this 
module is also a elective for different faculties. So we're just basically going to give an overview of the object. So people interested in this um, module, I want to continue on with astronomy. We'll take this in the second, uh, first semester and second year. Then you will do the math and physics behind this. But this will only give you an overview of the course. So we're not going to really do something in math. We're not going to really do something in physics, but it's rather going to be a theoretical overview of these different objects. Okay, thank you. It's a pleasure. So if you guys have no further questions, you're more than welcome to log off. Then tomorrow we're going to start with our first proper lecture. I hope you guys will enjoy it. So it's more about memorizing, not memorizing, but just understanding. So it's a pleasure. So if you guys have no further questions, then I will see you again online in tomorrow's class for safety reasons. Please be safe when you try to get onto campus and off campus in the next few days due to the protest action. I apologize for the class being online, but we have no other choice. Safety comes first. And then I will upload this video later this afternoon to YouTube. You're more than welcome to contact me if you have any questions. Otherwise, thank you so much for attending. Have a wonderful afternoon and good luck with your first semester.